You're watching Car Babble. I'm Ewan, and this is the 2018 Mercedes C Class Estate C200 AMG Line Premium. <laughs> Like me, you see the merits of estates or wagons over SUVs, which always make loads of compromises. And good for you, because I would love to still own an estate, but my wife said otherwise, and she wanted an SUV. And I'm sure there's lots of people can sympathize with that. But anyway, if you really want one, but you also don't want a stupidly big one, like a hearse, you know, like there's quite a few really big estates out there, but you want something that's still got a bit of practicality, but also says, I'm doing okay in life. Well, the chances are you're looking at a premium brand such as Z Germans, an Audi A4 Avant, BMW 3 Series Touring, or this C-Class Estate, or maybe even a Volvo V60, which is Swedish stroke Chinese made. But anyway, that's the, your main options, basically. So is the C-Class Estate the one to go for as a used buy? And I want to make this clear that I'm talking more as a used buy because old German cars, brand new premium ones, are super expensive and generally super awesome. But as a used buy, where does the value really sit? So that's what we're gonna focus on in this video. So if you enjoy my videos, don't forget to like and subscribe. Otherwise, buckle up, and let's get into it. Now, normally I would walk around the car a bit, but it's absolutely pishing it down. It's been like this all day and it won't stop. So I don't really have an opportunity to do much filming outside of the car. So I'm gonna try and tell you everything from inside the car on this one. And yeah, we'll cover all the usual bases. Now, as always, I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments about the looks of this car. But my opinion is it's a nice looking car. It's a really nice looking estate. And for me, the most important thing with Mercedes is they age really well, unlike Audis. Like over time, they don't change their design very much and they also don't change their cars that often. So you get quite a long period where the same car is the current model. This one has a more recent model, but you would barely tell the difference with that either. And this was facelifted in 2018. And again, most of the changes were interior. So you don't see much of a difference after that. So this car, even going back from 2013 to 2017, which is this pre-facelift era, is still quite a fresh looking car, I think. And yeah, I think it's aged really well. So as a used buy, that really matters. Now, when you buy a Mercedes, you want it to feel like it's got a bit of a sense of occasion and everything about it in here has a feeling of class and perceived quality for sure. There are some areas where the quality isn't as good as it looks, um, but the fit and finish mostly is good. There's no moving the center console. Touch points for your elbows mainly because that's where you really touch. They're soft. Up here, soft. Steering wheel is a nice thickness. Not as squidgy as a BMW's, but it's a nice thickness and yeah, it feels nice to hold in the hands. Buttons are nicely damped on the steering wheel. Buttons are nicely damped on the center console. And yeah, everything feels pretty good except for a wee bit of piano black down the center here by the scroll wheel and a wee bit up here as well. This infotainment system, we'll come back to that, but that's for me what lights the side down. It really is just this like old school iPad thing stuck in the middle there with this huge bezel around it. Don't know what they were thinking there, but thankfully in the facelift they addressed that. So that might be a reason to go for the facelift. Door close, if I can catch the door. That's a solid door close. The quality is really good there. Can hold the steering wheel at the same time as well when you're driving. And the seat is really comfy with this Artico fake leather. You don't need to get the one with the, the, the real leather. It's like another 800 quid. So if you're looking for this used, it might have that. But yeah, I don't think that's a, a, an option you need to go searching for because these seats are really comfy. Loads of adjustment in the premium pack. You've got electric seats, thigh extensions, memory, heated seats, the works. Really good seats. Yeah, comfy. One thing though is the driving position, as much as it feels quite square here, the accelerator pedal is quite far off to the right there. And yeah, that's... That is way over there. Like, why Why did they do that? Mercedes have been criticized for this before. They're not the only German car maker to get criticized for that, but I don't know why that's even a thing. So like, just move it to the left a little bit. Am I missing something here? Is there some major engineering flaw here that I'm missing that you can't do that? Just make it wider maybe then, I don't know. Just seems to be a little bit of a stupid problem to have. But over time, if you've got back problems, that could make you feel a bit twisted. So that's definitely something to be mindful of. Now, storage, it's a bit interesting, to be honest. Um, let's get the good parts out of the way first. You've got this big center bin here with two USB ports and SD card slot. And then you've got this bit here at the front where you can put your phone and it does fit there. And coins or whatever there. There's a 12 volt socket in there too. But uh, no cup holders, zero cup holders. Um, the only thing you've got is recesses in the door bins, which will fit a big bottle. Um, but yeah, if you've got like little like McDonald's coffee cups or something, where are they gonna go? There's nowhere to put them. So that's interesting. 
but they're quite big uh, door bins and they've got rubber mats which will stop things rattling about too much so that's good shame they couldn't need the rubber mats in the back where the lego is going to be and then you've got a big glove box which is yeah reasonably decent size and a sunglasses holder like to see that now connectivity in this car um i mentioned the usb ports and the sd card reader isn't too bad but being the age of the car it is it doesn't have the option of Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, not at all. So if you want to do media streaming and all that, you're going to have to do it through Bluetooth, which can be a bit hit and miss in some cars. Don't know what it's like in this one. Or you can use cables or use the SD card reader. So yeah, there are your options basically. And then you've got this fairly old school sat nav, which is Garmin in the premium and below spec. If you go premium plus, you get the command online, a slightly bigger screen. And that infotainment system has, a, yeah, it's a Mercedes um sat nav but yeah a third party infotainment sat nav i don't really think that is really mercedes um but yeah that's what you get in this car the owner says it works all right so take his word for that i don't have a lot of time in this car to check that but he says it does generally do the main destinations but obviously you have to update it to keep it current now for me the best part of this car is this center console if you sort of pretend that the infotainment's not there and you've got all these nicely damped shortcut buttons here for your physical controls for your AC, great that they still got that. And then you've got your physical shortcut buttons for nav, radio, media, telephone. I'm like, yep, yeah, that's as simple as it needs to be. Press that and then you're into the right part of the system. And then you can use your steering wheel to control things from there. And yeah, the, the steering wheel controls are actually quite good for functionality. You've got your telephone settings on and voice control on the right. And then on the left, you've got, um, you can turn it off and you, you can scroll up and down, etc. Really quite good. And then you've got this bit at the bottom here, which is where your, um, your scroll wheel is. I don't think it's quite as premium feeling as a BMW one, and it's not as clicky and nice to, to turn as, as an Audi one, but it's all right. Just the piano black bothers me a little bit. This one doesn't have the um, little pad that you can like write destinations in with your fingers. I think you need the premium plus pack for that. So there's no wee rest for your wrist either, but yeah, it's very minimalist, very easy. You've got your sport dynamic um, individual comfort eco settings on your drive modes and yeah a couple other buttons as well but yeah barring the piano black i like this and it's so minimalist because you've got your gear stocks up here where your indicator stocks are which i really like and so yeah it clears a lot of clutter but the infotainment system and just the look of it more than anything is really my issue i just don't understand why why they did this with this massive black rim around the infotainment like either make the screen just bigger to fill that space or take off some of the blackness around the outside. There's no need for it to be like that. That is literally like the first ever iPad made stuck on to the dash. Really was not a good design. And yeah, you shouldn't have to go up to the top spec premium plus pack to get a slightly bigger screen that doesn't look quite so much of an eyesore. Yeah, they really dropped the ball with that one. And that's definitely a reason to maybe get the facelift because you have a different shape screen. It looks a bit better and you also get a digital cockpit. But Functionality wise, it's all right. It's the graphics are showing their age a bit, but yeah, it's colorful enough and you can navigate around it pretty well. And because you've got these shortcut buttons, you're never more than a click or two away from where you want to be. So that's the main thing for me is it's not that difficult to use. And yeah, I don't think I would functionally find it annoying over time. And I like the fact you can do quite a lot with your steering wheel controls. It's just the look of it that goes, Ugh. but this digital cockpit, yeah, it does the job. You know, you get enough information there and you can customize it a wee bit and you can scroll through bits and press your steering wheel. Easy to operate and you've still got your retro dials there as well. No head up display with this age of car either, but overall I've got no real issues with this. But yeah, they did refresh that with a full digital cockpit layer on, it looked a lot more modern, but that doesn't concern me, just this. So if you go for the premium pack, you get a few niceties, including this panoramic sunroof, which I think really, really looks good. It's really quite big and yep, kids will love that. And you've also got a memory seats, electric memory seats on both sides and three position memory. So if you've got somebody alternating who's driving this car a lot, you'll be glad you had that. Unlike in my BMW, which is manual seats. And when I get in it after my wife's been driving it, I'm like, but if you really want banging tunes, then you want the premium plus pack because you then get the upgraded Burmester sound system, which is 590 watts. Apparently, it's one of the best systems on the market. I'd love to hear it for myself, but yeah, apparently it's amazing. So if you're really into your tunes, that's what I go for. But you also get this bigger infotainment screen and you get less of a bezel around it, more importantly. And you get the command online system as well as opposed to Garmin SatNav. So those are maybe reasons to upgrade to the premium plus pack but yeah the premium does come pretty well equipped you also get keyless entry with the premium pack and the kick sensor for the boot although when i tried to operate it earlier it didn't work 
But if you are searching for one of these as a used car, other options you might want to think about would be the adaptive air suspension to search for. If it's got that, there's not going to be many will have it, to be honest, as a used car. I don't think it's one that people are going to tick the box of much because it's quite expensive. However, it is amazing, apparently. And so if you have that, yeah, it's going to ride fantastically over bumps. But also, if it breaks, it'll be very expensive to repair. You can also get the upgraded leather seats I talked about. And you can also get a driver assistance pack, which will give you a suite of safety equipment because this car has very little of it, a standard. And then on top of that, you'll get adaptive cruise control. And that's great. I love being able to set my distance from the car in front of more way and just chill out. So those are things you might want to look for, especially, yeah, if you really want to spend a lot of money. <laughs> One thing this car doesn't have is high beam assist. You're going to have to do dipping your beams manually, which is really a bit of a shame. Yeah, I thought it would maybe have that considering it's got automatic um, LED headlights, you know, for when it gets dark and it's got automatic wipers, but no, it doesn't have that. So that's a bit of a bummer. You do have these gear shift paddles as well, though, which are nice and they feel premium too. But pricing wise, Mercedes hold their value better than BMWs and Audis. And so you can look at that from two different ways. If you're buying it used, uh, a few years old, like five years old, up to 50,000 the clock, you'll probably pay low 20s for one of these in this spec. And if you were to go for the equivalent BMW or Audi, you'll probably be a couple of grand less. So if you're buying it on cash, yeah, their value proposition might be better. But if you're going to PCP, you might get a better deal on a used PCP for a Merc because of that. But new, this car was about 38 grand five years ago. And if you were to buy this car now in the same spec new, you're about 50 grand. And obviously you can have a ridiculous lead time as well. So things have moved on quite a bit on price. And that's why I think if you want to get behind the wheel of a premium German car these days, you really want to not discount a used one because the value proposition just seems to make a lot more sense. Now, it's no Volvo V60, so if you were to drive it off a cliff, you probably would die. You know, it's not like in a Volvo where, yeah, you, chances are somehow you'll survive it because they're just, they put all their budget into safety, and that's great. But it is a pretty safe car. You've got airbags in the back there as well. Generally speaking, this is quite a safe car. It scored five stars in Euro NCAP safety ratings, good crash protection. So you do have peace of mind that this car will probably do okay in most crashes. So yeah, that's good. <laughs>of the weather i'm not going to go and do a video outside the boot so we'll just talk about it with some b-roll over the top 490 liters with this car and if you put all the seats down you get 1510 liters and for most families that's probably going to do the job if you've got a dog eh, might be getting a wee bit snug in there if you're going to put them in the boot and your stuff but it's quite a nice boot and I, when i when i opened it up i thought it feels bigger than 490 liters and you've got 40 20 40 split folding seats a couple of tie down points there's a 12 volt in there no spare tire though at all so you're gonna get one of those little cans that does nothing which is a shame but yeah other than that i think it's a fairly good load bay and you can electrically put the back seats down so yeah like it so the back seat of the c-class estate yeah pretty good actually i'd say for a couple of kids long journeys they will be very comfortable back here adults yeah yeah my head just hit off the side there actually i do feel like it's quite close to your head there but yeah, not the best headroom. Knee room, seats in driving position, I'm five foot nine. Uh, there's recesses in the back of the seat, so I do feel like knee room's pretty good. Toe room isn't amazing. Elbow rests, this one here is reasonably soft and feels just like the driver's seat one. You've got the center armrest here, and that's really soft. And then you've got these two cup holders that pull out. And yeah, as I said in my EQC video, I've got this really odd over-designed style that it's all right when there's a bottle in there, but the minute you take the bottle out, they just ping back. Don't really like that, but these seats are very comfortable, but three people sitting abreast, not so much. I would say this middle seat is higher up. It's, yeah, it's pretty soft, but huge transmission tunnel. So yeah, it's not gonna be very comfy for legs with three people in here. So I wouldn't really say this is a three seater for long journeys, but it's pretty nice back here. You've got these little pockets that feel like airplane style pockets, a couple of vents, and obviously this pan roof lets a lot of air in. Yeah, not bad. So I'm out on the road in the C200, which is a four cylinder turbocharged petrol engine. And this one's got rear wheel drive. You can get formatic all wheel drive. You can also get some diesel engines and formatic with those as well. I'll put the specs up on the screen for those. But this one has 181 brake horsepower, 300 newton meters of torque, which is not too bad for a four cylinder petrol. And I'll do zero to 16, seven and a half seconds, which is usefully quick. Now, having just sat in a heap of traffic there, I did notice that the 
petrol engine was quite loud at idle. I thought it would be a bit quieter than that, a bit more hushed. Thought the diesel would be the one that might be, you know, more audible, but yeah, I could really hear it idling there, so I'm a bit surprised at how unrefined that was. Where I'm a bit disappointed is the refinement. I don't think it's particularly quiet in here. Could be the tires, the surfaces are pretty bad, but it's um it's not the quietest in here. You there are other premium brands that do refinement in that regard, just that bit better. The visibility is excellent, you've got a really good back window and the pillars aren't too bad all the way around. You don't have any fancy uh, safety equipment and cameras or even blind spot monitoring with this one at the moment, so you don't really have a lot of aids to help you there, but you do have a rear camera that is really high resolution, so that's good. So I'm going to launch this with my non-specialist timing gear and see if I can get a feel for how fast this is. Yeah, it's 60. Yeah, I'd say that's about right. That really does have quite a bit of poke. Lost a bit of grip there with the wet conditions and rear wheel drive, but wow, that engine revved out pretty good. Now, where I am really quite impressed with this is the steering and the handling. The gap between this and the 3 Series ain't all that much. The steering's arguably better, actually, than my F30 3 Series. Handling is really quite competent, and yeah, I feel like I'm getting pushed out of the corners nicely and there's not a lot of body roll. Yeah, it's really pretty good, but this car definitely would benefit from having the adaptive air suspension because it is quite firm. Uh, I do feel like I'm fidgeting about a wee bit. I, like I say, I'm driving on pretty rubbish roads right now, but it is jumping about a wee bit, and at low speeds I felt a few bumps, so it's not serene like an S-Class. <laughs> this has a seven-speed torque converter gearbox. You do get a nine-speed laterally, but meshes the gears together really well. Really do like that. One thing I'm not really loving is when you're using indicator stocks to change gear, it feels a bit like when you're pressing a button in newer cars that have the shift by wire. Just a slight lack of feel about what gear you're going into sometimes, but it's still really convenient to have it as an indicator stock and to have the space back in the middle console. But yeah, it is just a little bit clunky and I'm like, mm, am I in reverse? You know, it's not absolutely perfect in that regard. But this thing with the accelerator pedal being almost outside the car, you know, it feels like I'm waving my foot at people as I drive past. I don't get that, I really don't, and I'd love for somebody to tell me if there's the engineering reason behind that, but surely if they just move the steering wheel over, they just mirror everything, and I have a feeling in a left-hand drive car, the Germans will not be complaining about that. Now, I'm a fan of diesels over petrols at the moment. Sorry, tree huggers. I just think for where I live, they make more sense. You know, you'll get way better fuel economy out of diesel than you will out of petrol, and yeah, the emissions thing's not as much of an issue. I don't worry about breathing in harsh fumes because of where I live, you know, if I was in a city, yeah, maybe a bit more so, but you would get quite a bit more torque if you went for the diesel over the petrol in this car and still fairly good performance, similar performance to this. But this one is getting 30 miles per gallon roughly in the real world, which is not amazing, um, but for the amount of performance you've got and given the price of petrols coming down a bit, it's maybe not going to be too much of an issue for you. But yeah, I personally think the diesel would be my choice. You would certainly get quite a bit better fuel economy out of them and it would outweigh the extra cost of the diesel. So final thoughts on the C-Class Estate. Well, if I was gonna buy a premium estate, I would probably get a BMW 3 Series, but that's because I love BMW's infotainment and I still think it looks really good quite a few years on if we're talking about the older generation F30. I wouldn't buy an Audi A4 Avant because I don't like dual clutch gearboxes, so that would be something that would concern me out of warranty. And I wouldn't buy a Volvo because they're not very good to drive. This one is really quite good to drive, but it's not quite as refined and as comfortable over unbroken surfaces as I thought it would be, especially riding on only 18s. Bit disappointed with that, but the seats are super comfortable and there's definitely a sense of occasion in a Mercedes and it looks really classy and elegant. I think this car will age really well over time and you won't look like you're driving a super old car. So it's really about what's important to you when you're buying a used car. For me, BMW still edges it, but I do really like this car and yeah, I could spend quite a lot of time in this thing. So those are my thoughts. I would love to know yours. So please do leave me a comment below. And if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a like because it really helps the channel and consider subscribing as well because there's a lot more coming up. Anyway, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Thank you.